But I wanted to show you just the verses that people try to use in order to justify baptizing with water for salvation and just give you an explanation of what it means. Um, but let's have a look at, at a couple of them. So one, one way, you know, they try and justify uh, baptism with water to save you is this idea, I won't turn there in the Old Testament because it's all through the Old Testament Levitical priesthood, but this idea of um, being washed, right? With, washed with water. So they'll take this Old Testament, these Old Testament passage of the Levitical priesthood where the priests would need to wash themselves and bathe themselves in water in order to be cleansed, in order to do the service of the tabernacle. Now, number one, we learn in Hebrews that the water, you know, those ordinances and those, you know, the carnal ordinance, the meats, drinks, the diverse washings and carnal ordinances, these never took away sin. So number one, this water never actually cleansed them of sin. Um, <clears throat> but remember as well that the baptism with water doesn't represent this washing of water from the Old Testament. What does it represent? It represents the death of being uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost where we are buried into his death and one day we'll be raised in the likeness of his resurrection. So they'll try and say, you know, you should be washed with water and that's why we need to be baptized because you need to be baptized and, and be washed with water. But that's not what the baptism with water represents. We already covered that. But, you know, it's interesting. What, what does that Old Testament washing actually represent, is resen represented by in the New Testament? I thought I might give you a thought here, but it says here in verse, uh, let's read from verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Um, for we are, members of his, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man uh, leave his... Oh, sorry, I must have missed it. Wait a second, what verse am I up to? Oh, sorry, I read, I read too late. Uh, sorry, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. So there's that cleansing of sin. He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So if you're wondering what that washing and that bathing in the Old Testament, what, how it translates into the New Testament, they were washed with water so they could present themselves before the Lord. And we see here in Ephesians 5 that Christ washes the church with the washing of water by the word. So his word is actually the one that cleanses us and washes us so that we can then be presented uh, to um, to God, so it doesn't. It's this washing of water uh, does not show that baptism needs to be uh, a requirement for salvation. Uh, let's have a look at John three verse five. Let's just go back here. <clears throat> this is another passage where people say that you need to be baptized with water in order to be saved. The conversation between Jesus Christ and Nicodemus in John three. <clears throat> Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So they'll focus on verse 5, and they'll say, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water. See, so there you go, there's that water birth. You have to be born not only of the Spirit, so you don't only have to be saved and baptized in the Spirit, you need to be born of water and baptized with the water. So they say, you see there, you can't enter into the kingdom of God unless you are baptized with water and you're baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now, is this what this passage is actually saying? Because we need to read this passage in context. Let's read verse 4. It says, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old, and he's talking about the second birth, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So we see there in verse 4, it's talking about a physical birth, his mother's womb. Then it talks about being born of the water of the Spirit. But in verse 6, this is where he clarifies what he's talking about. Because we see there two births, right? 
except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. So there's that first birth and then the second birth. But what is he actually talking about? Well, if you read verse 6, he says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So the two births that he's talking about is your first physical birth, and then the second birth, being born again, is that birth when we are, you know, we are baptized by the Holy Ghost, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we are born into God's kingdom. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So, you know, is this talking about baptism with water? No, I don't think so. I, think it's, it, it, I believe it is talking about what well, is talking about your first physical birth. That's what the born, born of water um, is talking about. And, you know, number two, baptism, remember, it represents the death. Of Jesus Christ being buried with him by baptism into death it doesn't represent the birth right it represents the death of Jesus Christ not the birth of Jesus Christ not our birth either so being born of water doesn't make sense if it's talking about being saved by being baptized by baptized by water but to help you understand as well you know being born of water often you know when a woman is about to give birth what do we say when the water breaks Right? So we can see there that when you are born of water, it's talking about that physical birth, the woman's water breaking. And I believe that I can show you a verse in the Bible that actually supports this idea that being physically born is being born by or through the waters that break when a woman is about to give birth. I want to show you this verse in Job 38.8. You know, God responding to Job here in Job 38 um, talking about the creation and how nature works and things like that. And he says this verse here in verse 8, Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? So we see there that connection between the waters being stopped, the waters of the sea and the waters issuing out of the, out of the womb when a woman gives birth. Uh, and you might be wondering, what is he talking about here, shutting up the sea with doors when it breaks forth? I, I think it's just basically talking about you know, the, the coast and putting boundaries on the sea, like the, the sea is contained. It's, you know, it's, it's a poetic uh, way of talking about it here. So he shut up the, deep, uh, the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb, saying that God is a, it, it created the earth to stop the power of the sea and to stop the power of the earth. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, stop the power of the waves. Um, so we see that connection there between the waters and the womb. So that's what I believe uh, John 3 is talking about. Let's have a look at a couple of others. Acts 2, verse 37. Now when they heard this, this is Peter preaching at the day of Pentecost. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So they'll turn to this verse, and this is probably you know, a Pentecostal's you know, pet verse, because they'll say, you know, the day of Pentecost, you know, when, they, when the men asked Peter, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So you see that you need to repent and you need to be baptized in order to have your sins remitted. But is that what that verse actually means? I mean, you could read it to make it mean that way, but then it would contradict everything else that we've, we've, we've talked about thus far, about what baptism is, the fact that salvation is not by works, um, that the fact that water cannot wash away your sins. So what is he talking about here? Well, let's compare this to Acts 16, verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, did Peter say that in Acts 2? He just said, uh, the, the people just asked him, men and brethren, what shall we do? They, he didn't, they didn't say to Peter, you know, what shall we do to be saved? They just said, what shall we do? But in Acts 16.30, we see the phrase there, what must I do to be saved? 
and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved with thy house. So we see there in Acts 16 that in order to be saved, it's only believe. So what is Acts 2 talking about? You know, when it says, men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, there are many things that we should do as believers, right? You know, we ought to keep the commandments. We ought to pray. We ought to read our Bible. But he says a couple of other things that we need to do. You know, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent. So that is probably the, the repenting from, you know, dead works and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But what also shall, should we do? We should be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So baptism is a commandment. It was commanded here by Peter that they should repent and be baptized with water. But what does it mean here where it says, you know, baptize in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins? They say there, well, why, why does it say you need to be baptized for the remission of sins? Meaning, well, you'll get the remission of sins if you're baptized. Well, for the word for can have, you know, different meanings. Um, because you could say, uh, here's an example, and this is the example that most people will give. If you had a poster and it said, wanted for murder. You wouldn't read that poster and say, well, we want this person in order to commit a murder, unless you're trying to hire an assassin, right? Generally, what it means is they're wanted because they have committed murder. Do you see? So the wanted for murder. So for doesn't always mean in order to have your sins remitted. It can also mean because you have had your sins remitted, you should be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So that's another way you can understand that verse. We're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, not in order to get our sins remitted, but because our sins have been remitted. That's why we are baptized with water. Mark 16, 16. Last passage um, where people will really sort of use this in order to promote being baptized with water in order to be saved. Um, after Jesus gives the Great Commission here in Acts six, uh, Mark 16, it says here, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So they'll say there, Ah, see, if you have to believe and you have to be baptized. Because Jesus says there very clearly, you have to believe and be baptized to be saved. That's why you have to be baptized with water to be saved. But is that really... What, it, what, it's, what it's talking about. Let's, let's just read the rest. But he that believeth not shall be damned, and these shine, signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up in, into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So why then does it say there, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved? Well, number one, is this talking about the baptism with water or is it talking about the baptism with the Holy Ghost? Because it could be talking about both, right? Um, I, believe, I believe more so, I'm not 100%, but I believe that's talking about the baptism with the Holy Ghost. And the reason why I think it's talking about the baptism with the Holy Ghost, well, number one, if he says, if he, he that believeth and is baptized, talking about the baptism with the Holy Ghost, well, that's every believer. Because every believer that believes is baptized by the Holy Ghost and you will be saved. If it's talking about the baptism with water, we can see there in that whole verse that it's not the water baptism that saves you or condemns you because it says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So we see there that it's not that if you're not baptized and, not, and you don't believe, you'll be damned. It's only the faith that damns you. So faith is what saves you. Yes, if you believe and you're baptized with water, you are saved. It's a true statement. But we know from other scriptures that the baptism of water is not a part of that salvation. But I personally think that it could be talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because it starts to talk about the signs and the miracles that will follow them that believe and are baptized with the Holy Ghost. So it says here, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak new tongues, 
They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And this is what we see all through the book of Acts. When they, were, when they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and then they received that gift of the Holy Ghost, they were baptized with the Holy Ghost, they, they did these miracles, they did these signs and these wonders, they spake with tongues and you know, they, they had all these signs. And I believe that's what they're talking about. Now, why do we who are baptized with the Holy Ghost now no longer have those signs? Well, I personally believe, you know, Number one, I think that's why it's very important that we read verses in context, you know, because Jesus saying, go ye into the world and preach the gospel was only said to these people. And we don't, I don't think we should take the position that he said it to everybody. I think we, we, we keep on doing that commandment because what was committed to them was then committed to us. We see that in the epistles. But if we just say, oh, you know, he, Jesus is commanding that to every believer, then we come across the problem of, well, if Jesus is saying, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every individual believer, then why doesn't every individual believer have these signs that follow them? And the Muslims will often say this and say, well, there's the test of a true believer. You drink some poison and prove to me whether you're a true believer. But they're misunderstanding this passage because they're not understanding it in the context of actually Jesus sending these disciples and these apostles out and saying that the signs will be with them. They will, be, they will one day be baptized with the Holy Ghost at the day of Pentecost and they will fulfill all these signs. But why do we not see those signs today? My position on that is, is because God does things with a purpose. He doesn't just do things to glorify man and to give man like a kick and say, oh, hey, look, it's great. I can, do, I can speak in new tongues. I can do all these things. He's doing it for a purpose. And we see this purpose here in verse 20. It says, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So why were the early apostles and the prophets and the disciples given these miraculous signs, able to speak with new tongues? Well, we see at the day of Pentecost that they were given the gift of tongues so that they could get the gospel out to nations where they didn't speak that language, but also because they did not have the written word of God or the written New Testament as we have it today, the signs were given to them to confirm that what they were preaching was the word of God. And that's why... We see through, as you read through the New Testament, why did Paul say to Timothy, drink a little wine for thy, stomach, for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities? Why didn't he just lay his hands on him and heal him? Because we can see through the New Testament that those gifts were starting to fade. They were starting to go away as the word of God was being written down, as it was being confirmed. And now that we have it, there's not a purpose for them anymore. Um, that's what I believe uh, about that. Um, sorry to get off on that rabbit trail. 